I, I'm trained in world religions and I am Jewish and I know more than the average you know, person I think about Judaism. I thought, my gosh, I have to help my people. Something very terrible is really happening in academia that's indoctrinating an entire generation. They don't get to hear various viewpoints because professors, for the most part, are really very um, committed to viewpoint conformity, as, as, I, um, as I call it. Restore Childhood podcast. And today I'm excited to introduce you to Marcy Braverman, um, who has become a friend through social media, although we've never actually met in person. Um, and she's based in North Carolina. Um, Marcy and I met on a COVID uh, tyranny group on Facebook where we were um, chatting about uh, the mandates and its impact on us and our families. And um, recently, Marcy announced on that group that she became the Director of Academic Affairs at the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, um, where she's working with David Bernstein, somebody I've spoken with over the months. Um, he wrote a book called Woke Anti-Semitism, and it was really ahead of its time. Um, and so Marcy and I have been talking about uh, college campus anti-Semitism and illiberalism on, on college campuses, very foreign to, to me as a 93 undergrad graduate at uh, NYU, where I felt pretty, pretty free to express myself in any way I wanted to, including as a Jew. Um, and I think Marcy, who's around my age, has, has expressed the same. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Marcy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here for this important conversation. And I'll just say a little bit more about my background, I guess. So I was an undergrad at University of Rochester, graduated in 1993, and thought I would heal the world by becoming a professor of world religions so that I can help people um, gain you know, responsible information about uh, religions instead of being sort of swallowed up by disinformation in the media. So I went to UC Santa Barbara to study world religions and my area of expertise is Indian traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, yoga traditions. And I have always had one foot in academia, but somewhere along the way, I think after I graduated actually, I uh, realized that I wanted to raise a, a family in a way that I was very present. So I've always taught part-time in, in universities, a few on the West Coast and now in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Um, and in the mid 1990s, I noticed that yoga was really becoming very, very popular. And so I sort of entrepreneurialized my knowledge of um, the language of yoga and the history of yoga. And I started a business called Sanskrit Revolution, where I teach those topics to curious adults who do not want to go back to college. Um, but yoga teacher training programs include me for uh, three hours, sometimes an entire weekend to give them like a real download of solid information. And sometimes people say that they feel like they've gone back to college and I um, explain that this is, you know, discipline with respect to knowledge, whereas most of yoga is about, you know, physical practices and everything, um, and the discipline of the mind and the body, this is really a discipline of the mind, and so I uh, teach people about 5,000 years of text, teachers, and traditions in, in, in yoga, um, but that's really the surface, because the sort of underlying mission of, of my class, actually, and I'm very explicit about this with everybody, is to teach people how to link evidence and argument, and to sort of tease out all the um, romanticized notions that they've swallowed around the history of yoga and people operate all the time um, with, with misinformation. They don't even realize that they're in an echo chamber. So I have a lot of themes that I weave into the class to help people realize that um, they don't really know what they're talking about, actually. And so as they are learning about yoga's past, they're actually um, taking lessons that they can incorporate into other uh, communities in their lives, you know, religious communities, political communities, and the whole thing. So it's um, like a very rewarding thing to do because it's uh, it's really soul searching and people seeking truths. And um, you know, I find it very meaningful. And um, so I've done that for for a while. And you know, I, I tell all my students that I don't want to accidentally indoctrinate you. So don't take my word for it. You know, take my class and then go. Please take other people's classes. And so in that way. I think I'm um, like a bit rare because uh, most professors are um, hell bent actually on um, getting people on board with their agenda. They're very politicized and explicit about it even. And it really bothers me because I think it compromises the field of education. Um, but people are very proudly sort of activists. And even some professors I think are 
provocateurs and, you know, they're very happy to get people on board with their, um, you know, viewpoints about anything. Um, and, you know, one concern of mine that I noticed creeping in, uh, you know, very strongly, at least around eight years ago, was this very intense anti-Zionism that was mainstreamed in, in academia as a, an expression of a deeper, not only illiberalism, but I think an anti-liberalism. And that really started bothering me. So even though my area of expertise is Indian traditions, I, I'm trained in world religions and I am Jewish and I know more than the average you know, person I think about Judaism. I thought, my gosh, I have to help my people. Something very terrible is really happening in academia that's indoctrinating an entire generation. They don't get to hear various viewpoints because professors, for the most part, are really very um, committed to viewpoint conformity, as, as, I, um, as I call it. I do have like a very clear memory of one day that was like one of those um, turning points for me where I, I noticed I was friends, still am, with a retired Jewish studies professor who I noticed is he was like a unicorn. He was posting pro-Israel things on, on his Facebook page. And I thought, like, who is this guy? He's very unusual. And so um, and I knew of him. He's a generation older than me or two, actually, probably because he's he's already retired. But I, I Facebook messaged him. I was like, you know, what's going on? You're posting these pro-Israel things, which is truly very unheard of in academia. And, uh, you know, obviously he was retired, so he didn't have his job at stake. Um, but he did tell me, and in no uncertain terms, if you ever want to work in academia, do not post anything publicly that's pro-Israel. And I remember where I was standing in my kitchen when I read his message, and I already knew that that was the case. But when he said it so clearly, I thought, there is something very wrong with this picture. This is anti-liberal. It's not tolerant. You know, this is coming from, you know, the, the, the progressives um, who are actually, you know, regressive, uh, as I see it, because they don't really want to have constructive debate to achieve uh, clarity and, and truths. They want to shut down certain views and, you know, the syllabi are constructed in such a way as to sort of shape the students' knowledge. You know, only certain speakers are invited to campus. Others are nowadays even like heckled off campus. It's just, it's so disappointing. And I think actually one of the emotions that I was feeling around the time that I, this, this awareness was growing in me was I'm like betrayal. Like I fell in love with learning as an undergrad. I had an amazing um, education in a very small religion department at University of Rochester. And my mentors there, you know, opened my mind and my heart to, to the world of knowledge. And I thought, I'm going to go teach people about knowledge. And I slowly realized that, that, that the university world is just, you know, it's never been anything uh, other than like viewpoint conformity, but it's even worse now. What do you think happened eight years? You said about eight years ago you noticed. It was it was it you noticing something that you hadn't noticed before, or was it something new that had happened? I mean, eight years ago, I guess hmm. that was right. What two thousand and fifteen, right before Trump? Yeah, I think it's both. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's both. I think I started noticing more, but I also think that. Um, like a slow trend that has been in the works for at least 20 years, started to really pick up speed a bit. And um, I think like what comes to mind is, is, is sort of a twofold sort of cause. One is that there is a massive amount of money coming into the university world from foreign sources so that the universities have been bought by foreign interests and most of that money is coming from rapidly anti-Israel governments. And maybe you've seen the charts of how much money is coming from like Qatar is, yep. is like the top. And billions over the past couple of decades. And Barry yeah. Weiss just did a huge story on that. But as I have you know, Googled it, I've seen that there have been stories about this for years, but we just weren't paying attention. We weren't paying attention and who the we are is like the general progressives. You know, I call myself a classic liberal. I welcome people. You know, I love people, you know, unless you want to annihilate me, you know, I, I don't have an issue with you. Obviously there are plenty of people who are interested in, you know, in annihilation, unfortunately. Um, but there is like this deep seated sort of irony in among the people who fancy themselves to be progressing um, because there's a lots of like actually regression in there in the sense that, um, well, the money came to forward certain ideologies 
most particular, you know, there's different words for it, but there's this sort of radical ideology that there's the, the white oppressors versus the, the black oppressed people. And that was bought by the universities and it's sold not only at that level, but it's absolutely in K through 12 in certain curricula. Um, there's even certain names for the, the history curricula that are, you know, scattered around the country. And um, so it starts, you know, very young with indoctrinating people. And they obviously don't even realize what's going on because so, but that, that's not coming through Kuwaiti or, or Qatari money. Right. I mean, that's something that the teachers unions have, have in, instituted into curriculum or, or is it coming from somewhere else? So I don't know exactly, you know, I'd still have to explore it. I think a lot, you know, this has been an open secret for a while. And I think people are becoming more informed about exactly what all the sources are. I think, you know, you follow the money and it does have to do with money, even if people don't realize that it has to do with money. Um, But it also has to do with the politics that people are sort of embedded in. And so there's this idea that, of course, everybody should get a fair share of, of um, you know, happy living or however you want to put it, that there should be social harmony and some people have been oppressed and it's true and it's awful and everybody should, you know, have their dreams come true and all of that. But what slowly started creeping in, I think, 1960s and kind of onward is this idea that white people are oppressors and black are oppressed, which in some instances is very horribly true, but it's not true in all instances. And to categorize humans according to their skin color I think is extremely, um, you know, a generalization and it's pigeonholing people due to, you know, an inheritable, you know, category such as skin color, and it doesn't pay attention to any nuances. And I think that in the effort to have everybody have a piece of the pie, it is actually for some people, and I never want to say all because it's always more nuanced than that, instead of sort of leveling the playing field. I think it's actually a power grab where people want to flip the, the, the hierarchy and, you know, silence people. And I, you know, I have plenty of white male friends who are like, well, I better not say anything. You know, I know I'm not welcome here. And I'm like, well, that's not really fixing it because until everyone's free, none of us right. are free. As we, we should say. have an equality of opportunity, not an equity of, of, out, of outcome. Right. I mean, that's where I come from, the Soviet Union. There was an incredible equity of outcome. Everybody had nothing except for like the KGB or like the the government, uh, whoever, like leaders or whatever. My parents had nothing. And that's why we left. I mean, not to mention the anti-Semitism. So, you know, I I have serious issues with equity and trying to to, you know, cut down people so that they can't, you know, achieve due to. Uh, you know, immutable characteristics. I mean, you should be able to work hard and achieve what you can achieve. And some of it is luck. Um, You know, I mean, there's only so much we can do to engineer the outcomes. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I think that there's a lot hinging on that word equity. Um, Yeah. So, uh, so tell me about what you're doing at the, First of all, I'd like to know more about the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. I've looked at the website and, you know, you guys have a really impressive board, um, including, I believe, the rabbi who just resigned from Harvard. Was, yeah, right? Rabbi Wolpe. Yeah, he wrote mm-hmm. a really a very, very impressive uh, tw- tweet yesterday um, about uh, why he was leaving. It was very generous <laughs> yeah. to the president of yeah. Harvard. Um, but also really heartbreaking to, to see through his eyes, you know, what, what he's seen at the school and, you know, around the country and the world. So um, if you could just talk about the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, um, what you do there, what the mission is, I would love that. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you said before about how David's book that he wrote called Woke Antisemitism, and he knows that the word woke is um, a provocative sort of word, and he says, call it whatever you want to say it, you know, whatever you want to call it, you can call it banana. Um, It was a bit ahead of its time. And he um, was shunned for what he was trying to say in the establishment five-ish years ago, and now is actually getting a lot of apologies because he slash I also saw 
And I think you did too. And a lot of us, you know, saw it coming sort of very creeping sort of slowly. And a lot of people didn't see it. And they're the people, a lot of the Jewish people anyway, are very shocked post 10 seven, like, Oh, our allies are not standing with us. I can't believe it, which is terrible. Um, but some of us are, are less surprised. So the focus at JILV, where I'm the director of academic affairs, so I focus mostly on the university world and the institute as a whole focuses on you know, the world in, in general, um, is to look at the nexus between this radical ideology, whatever you want to call it, of oppressor versus oppressed, and show how that is feeding uh, anti-Semitism and specifically uh, anti-Zionism, which is a modern day expression of anti-Semitism. And the way that it happens um, is, the, is the following. So most Jews in America appear to be white, you know, white passing, like I'm white passing. A lot of Jews don't call themselves white actually because they are only, you know, between zero or two degrees separate from Nazi Germany, where Jews were exterminated almost for not being white. So pigeonholing Jews as white is like a very problematic thing to do um, because our epigenetics are such that we carry the trauma of being almost annihilated, not just by the Nazis, but you know, plenty of other um, groups previously trying to, to rid the earth of Jews because we're not white, we're ethnically you know, different. So and we're having this conversation on Hanukkah, which was another time when they tried to eradicate the, I mean, every holidays around like, oh, they tried to kill us. Oh, nope, a few of us survived and there was a miracle, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. So this is happening during Hanukkah and most people probably don't know the history of Hanukkah, but it's about the Jews having been colonized by the Greeks around the year zero and we're throwing off the yoke of colonialism in our um, homeland, which is, you know, Judea, Jews are from Judea. And um, so we successfully, you know, survived that colonial regime. But most people don't know <laughs> about that history. Um, so yeah, so it's problematic to pigeonhole Jews as white for the reason that I just said, but also Jews come in every single skin color, you know, Jews are from Judea, and there are plenty of brown skinned Jews. In fact, I think the majority of Jewish people in Israel are brown skin and indistinguishable visibly from their other, you know, Middle Eastern neighbors. And so, yeah, categorizing people by skin color is absurd. And have very ways. different customs. Um, you yeah. know, my cousins grew up in a very Moroccan uh, Jewish area in uh, Jerusalem. And I remember going there as a child. And my cousins are pretty, you know, fair skinned, I guess, Eastern European Jews, but their friends were all pretty dark skinned and had very, very different customs that they brought with them from, you know, other parts of the Middle East, Tunisian Jews and Moroccan Jews, um, than my Eastern European cousins had coming from the Soviet Union. Um, they, they all happen to be Jewish, but if you saw them walking down the street together, they certainly weren't, you know, one race or whatever, however, one, you know, immutable characteristic. Yeah, definitely. Well, race is a social construct, according to anthropologists. So there's just a lot of ironies <laughs> that, that, that we sort of have to live with, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so I guess just to kind of touch on that history a little bit, the first temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 BCE. That's before the year zero. And, and that um, created the first Jewish diaspora. So Jews, most Jews left. There has been a continuous Jewish presence for all this time throughout the millennia, but most Jews were forced out of their homeland. It was a, you know, a forced diaspora. And then they went and cried on the rivers of Babylon, which is Psalm 137, I think. Uh, my favorite version of that is sung by Sinead O'Connor. In the waters of Babylon, we sat there and we wept. What were they weeping about? Their homeland, their homeland was colonized, exactly, by the Babylonians at that. What is the river of Babylon in modern day? Um, the river of Babylon is um, in modern day Iraq. So that's like the, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers um, in that part of the world. Yeah. It's not the Middle East that we're, that most people are thinking of because they were booted out of, of Jerusalem. And then the temple was rebuilt a couple hundred years later. 
And then it was destroyed by the Romans who occupied Jerusalem. And uh, the temple was destroyed in 70 of the common era. And that created more Jewish diaspora, which is why there are so many Jews living in different parts of the world. And they became, you know, um, immersed in the cultures in which they lived, which included plenty of, you know, modern day um, Muslim countries and, you know, intermarried and, and so became, you know, all sorts of different skin colors and some fairer skin and some, some darker skin. And uh, then sort of flashing forward, I guess, to, to 1948, which, uh, you know, was a very difficult slash celebratory time in different ways for different people. And lots of refugees um, were, were created in different directions. And I think like what doesn't usually get included in that conversation is around 600,000 Jewish refugees were forced out of their homelands, namely like Morocco and Yemen and Iran and, and other places where they had lived for hundreds or thousands of years. And so there was lots of movement in different directions. And they were forced out for being Jews. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah which is not usually part of this conversation or with this binary because Jews are pegged as white oppressors because of, well, you know, anti-Semitism, I suppose, is one of the reasons. Um, we certainly felt like white oppressors when we came here in 1977 with just our bags uh, from the Soviet Union when Carter and Brezhnev had a deal and, you know, Brezhnev said you can take the Soviet Jews and Carter thankfully didn't turn us away. Um, but we came with nothing. And thanks to some friends who were here first and also the New York um, uh, New American Society, Niana and Hayas, which was a Hebrew immigrant aid society, we were able to you know, learn English and start going to school and get a tiny apartment in Brooklyn in Sheepshead Bay. Um, so uh, it, this, this narrative is so utterly false and it reminds me of how the soviet jews who who live in this country really kind of smell this ideology long before native um, native jews who grew up were born and grew up here um even realize what's happening um, i think that you know there, there are so many uh uh, Russian Jews who've spoken out about anti-Semitism, like Ina Vernikov here in New York City. She's a city councilwoman. She's been fighting back against CUNY for the past couple of years. Um, but, you know, I think the, the local, you know, native born Jews here just don't even, you know, mostly know what's happening. I totally agree. I grew up in a bubble. I mean, anti-Semitism barely touched me in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. I can count on one hand sort of anti-Semitic things that I heard. Um, but now I have a lot of Soviet Jewish friends um, here in Charlotte, and they've been screaming, uh, you know, not necessarily literally, but trying to warn everybody something awful is coming down the pike. And having that lived experience of being a refugee, um, they saw what was happening, and now it's, you know, just so much worse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, I'm I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions about. Uh, we have a lot of viewers and 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 readers in in our audience who have kids who are planning to go to college either next year or you know in coming years or or parents of college age students. Um, how should we? assess the landscape. Um, where are we at now? We just heard these uh, presidents of Ivy League universities basically saying that calling for genocide of Jews really, you know, needs to be looked at in context. Um, I mean, we saw the context at NYU, at Cooper Union, when Jews were locked into a library to keep them from getting assaulted from by rioters. So, um, what I mean, I have a 13-year-old who's going to high school next year. I, I'm trying to figure out, like, what what's going to happen on the cal what's happening now in the college landscape, and what what should we expect, and what should we be doing? It's a really, really, really good question. Um, so my son is actually applying to college literally right now, and we removed UNC at Chapel Hill when we saw what was going on there, and a Title VI violation was just filed this morning, actually. 
So there's going to be some students who don't want to be in a toxic, toxic environment where, you know, the, from the top down, the leadership is not really including Jews in that proverbial safe space, you know, at all. And so I think you need to know where those, you know, schools are. There are going to be some other students who want to very, you know, specifically go into that environment to try to right the wrongs that have been done to you know, all students, but maybe Jewish students in particular, to fight the battle to make academia what it's ideally supposed to be, which is an inclusive place of learning for people that doesn't discriminate against anybody for all those categories, including country of origin, and that would be, you know, Israelis, um, but also all Jews, that is our ancient homeland. And as, as some people do say, the Holocaust happened because there was no Israel, there was no place for the Jews to go. It's not that Israel was created because of the Holocaust, it's that the Holocaust happened because there was no Israel. So for, for most Jews, Israel is a central component of our identity and our sense of um, you know, being able to survive. So I do see some movement of students from the Northeast down to the South where I live, which is just so ironic because when I moved here from LA, I was kind of moving somewhere where, you know, none of my friends knew where I was going. They kept asking me like, how's Georgia? I'm like, I'm not in Georgia. I'm in North Carolina. And I was like, I kind of fell off the face of the earth. And when I was growing up in New Jersey, I had this very sort of uh, typical um, sort of obnoxious view, I should, I'll call it now, of, you know, the South. It's like between New Jersey... Washington DC area um, and, and Florida, there was nothing like in the middle, um, which is not a nice way of looking at the country, obviously. And I see it, I recognize it now, but ironically now this is the place where a lot of students are looking to go to college because um, the universities in this area are not as captured by this ideology that, that pigeonholes people into these sort of seemingly immovable um, um, categories. And I know that there are different organizations right now that are doing campus surveys. So there's going to be more and more information coming out soon about which campuses are safe campuses. I know Hillel has a list and it's already been out, like where is a place that Jewish students will feel safe so people can look at Hillel. There's another organization called Tikva that I think has done some research in this way. Um, but there, I'm just looking uh, on some notes here. There's um, Campus uh, Pulse is going to be putting out a survey at some point soon. And so there will be more information for the crop of people who are applying to college a year from now. And I would just say definitely stay involved and um, look at these surveys that you know where you're sending your child. And also don't be afraid to call professors on different campuses and just say, you know, hey, what's going on in your campus? You know, what's really going on here? I know some Jewish studies professors who get calls from parents and they're not helicopter parents. This is like, I need to assess whether this is going to be an environment that is safe for my, my student. I think if people haven't heard some of the interviews um, that, are, that are happening right now, like there was an MIT student who described what's going on in her campus, people being told, don't come through the front door of the building, it's not safe for you. People hiding in their dorm rooms. I mean, it's like, it's a very serious situation uh, that, that is almost like invisible to people who, who, who it doesn't affect, I think is you know, part of the problem, just like any sort of ism. If it doesn't affect you, you don't pay attention to it as much. So there's you know, racism that, that some people don't see and there's anti-Semitism that people don't see and other uh, sorts of you know, prejudices that, that bubble up to the surface that don't affect everybody. And I think that, that right now anti-Semitism is, um, is percolating up and, and so people see it more, more you know, than they used to, especially if you're, if you're Jewish. So yeah, I would just keep your eye open for these surveys and make sure you're on email lists because they will include all the information that is being gathered right now and it will definitely be in place by the time people need to choose their colleges for next year. Of course, it's just ironic that I have this job um, to kind of keep track of and try to improve the situation on college campuses at the same time that my own child happens to be applying to colleges. Uh, thankfully, he didn't really want to go very far from home. And so Harvard was not on our, our list. And so he applied to a bunch of places in North Carolina. And I very carefully chose environments where I think I'll thrive, not just academically, but socially 
and Jewishly. And um, so actually he got his first acceptance last night on the first night of Hanukkah. Yeah, which is just so perfect. And I thought in the back of my mind, did, did this place just send his acceptance? And it, a lot of other people got accepted that, that, that evening as well. But did, did they do it because they know it's Hanukkah and they're sensitive to the plight that we're feeling right now? And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I kind of doubt it. But it was a very interesting sort of beshared moment where I felt like it was meant to be that he got in. Well, you know, I think I think one of the things that that we can do right now and now just talking to you about this makes me realize, you know, the FIRE organization, uh, which is for the Foundation for Individual uh, Rights and Speech. I can't remember. And expression. Exactly. Yeah, rights and expression um, mm -hmm. had uh, issued a, a list of colleges uh, that were, you know, the worst offenders in free speech to, mm -hmm. you know, the most liberal and um, the most uh, oppressive college was Harvard. Harvard. <laughs> yep. I know. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, sh short of, of having uh, this, the, the, the lists that Hillel or Tikva or whoever is, is, is putting together, I think parents can, can look at these lists now. And in fact, um, even six months ago, I was sending them to my best friend's daughter in LA, who was just looking to apply to colleges and said, you know, take a look at these schools, because if you do apply to, you know, the, the 10 worst offenders, I assure you the anti-Semitism is kind of part of the picture. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, I think that that's probably a good place to start if you can't find one of these lists or, or something like that. Yeah, I would get on the email list for FIRE, yeah. Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. It's been around right. for a couple decades already, yeah. found, bought, founded by a, a lawyer, and a lot of very helpful information um, comes through there. And yeah, there's a survey that was just published, the one that you just referenced, not that many months ago. Before October 7th, maybe around six months ago, Harvard was at the bottom. I think Cornell was also at the bottom. Mm -hmm. These are campuses that are really high in anti-Semitism and also campuses that receive the most money from foreign sources. Yep. So, and University of Chicago was pretty good, right? That was one of the better schools, I think. Um, and mm -hmm. also uh, some of the Florida schools. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you... Do you think is anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism anti-Semitism? Mm. So that's a great question. I would say absolutely yes. Anti-Semitism morphs throughout the millennia. The why of anti-Semitism has been studied, and I, you know, I won't get into that because it um, defies logic. I think, um, but anti-Semitism has taken many different forms throughout the ages, and the current form of it is, is anti-Zionism. Jews are from Judea. If we're gonna have indigenous studies programs at university campuses, they need to include uh, it, Jews. And frequently they don't. There's even an attempt to dissociate Jews from their homeland um, among some academics, which is a historical inaccuracy. It's an archaeological inaccuracy. Inaccuracy. It's a biblical inaccuracy, um, which most academics don't buy into the Bible, and you know that's fine. But you know we have archaeology and and history. All you have to do is go underground and dig and see. You know who was there. Um, and if if I if I can interrupt, I mean now that we're looking at information um, in a more dynamic way on the internet, not in books. Um, is it easier now for them to rewrite history because, you know, these kids are being told to go look at a website much easier to do that than print, you know, 50,000 copies of a book. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there a concern yeah. about that? Yeah. I mean, the disinformation is everywhere. And it's also the case, I think, that certain populations are very purposefully taught wrong information in order to get that next generation on board with um, a an ahistorical reality. So there are a lot of people who think that Jews popped over to Israel in 1948 from Germany. And it's just really sad. I mean, it's like you can understand why they came to the conclusion that they think that Jews colonized Israel if they're operating from 
wrong information, which is the Jews just came from Germany. If that's what, how they're operating, then of course they're going to come to that conclusion that Jews are colonizers. But that information is um, anti-Semitic propaganda that is absolutely not grounded in truth. And if anybody wants to dig in the ground um, or, or explore you know, various points of view, which most of them don't, um, they would find that um, that the homeland of the Jews, you know, is is Israel. Um, they could go to Masada for one thing. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you can, yeah. yeah. Which doesn't mean that they're only people from that part of the world. I mean, there are lots of different people who are, in, in, you know, native to that region. I mean, I think Islam was was founded in Arabia. You know, Arabs are from. Arabia and um, and then sort of you know through expansionism you know uh, are now in, in many different areas um, and I think most Jews just to segue a little bit are happy with um, the idea of coexistence like just give us our little spit of land if anybody looks at a map you can see Israel is like 0.2 percent of the Middle East I think and Jews are happy just to have their little you know, spit of land is really um, what it is. Um, but then there are some other people who want to erase Jewish indigeneity from that land and gobble up all the land in a way that just kind of reminds me of, you know, in kindergarten, we were all taught to share and we should share the space. Everybody should have a, have a space to be. And it doesn't make sense historically um, or even ideologically if you're going to be consistent because indigenous people should be able to live in their, their homeland but there's all these double standards. And so that applies to most native populations, except for the Jews who are pigeonholed as white oppressors because they appear to be white. Uh, and all the reasons you know that we were talking about, I think maybe 20 minutes ago or so. Yeah, which of course, you know, having that very narrow view of Jews means you've never been to Israel. <laughs> right. And you know very little about history. I mean, I remember, um, didn't Israel send an airplane to like Ethiopia to rescue the Jews? Wasn't there like a great story? Yeah. And I don't know if it was just an anecdote of, of uh, these Ethiopian Jews who were being expelled from Ethiopia because maybe it was in the seventies and uh, they'd yeah. never been on a plane before. And once they got on the plane, I think they set a fire to like cook. I mean, have you ever heard that story or is that just like a, a yeah, fable? no, it's not just a story. I think it's true. Anybody can Google it. And they were brought back to Israel um, and it's just an example of the fact that being Jewish, it's an ethno religion. It's not just a religion. It's, it's a, it's an ethno religion because it's a land-based people who were forced into a diaspora and then, you know, have the right of return. Um, and yeah, Israel is a very multicultural place. I mean, it's the only democracy in, in the Middle East, I think, but also, you know, there, there's so much diversity among Jews with respect to skin color and languages and, um, you know, cuisines and, and, and all the rest. And if anybody did go to Israel, they'd, they, they'd see that, that, that there are people who are serving in the IDF of all different skin colors and all different religions, too. There's this one photo, actually, that's coming to mind of, an, of a Muslim soldier praying next to a Jewish soldier, each in their own traditional way, uh, to defend their country. And that is something that you would not find in any other country in the region. And it's just a beautiful example of what's possible, I think, of people to, to coexist. But the language that um, some people are, are, are focused on is not peaceful coexistence. It's more like, um, you know, free, free Palestine, but, but that's code for free the Jews, uh, you know, make the land free of Jews, meaning wipe the Jews out. So what are things that people should be doing now? Like, what's the most important thing? Like, speak, to me, like, I try to speak to as many people as possible in real life, not just, you know, screaming behind a keyboard. Um, podcasts like this are great, but also just talking to people at the playground, you know, school pickup or, you know, at the park is good, like to kind of humanize the situation. And you see that it's not quite as polarizing when you actually, you know, encounter a, a regular person in the street. Um, but in terms of like, 
you know, sometimes it really feels like not doing enough, like what can I be doing to, to really make an impact? And are there certain initiatives or organizations or activities that you can recommend uh, mm -hmm. through GALB? Yeah. Well, I was going to say everybody should hopefully get on the email list of JILV.org. And there's a podcast every Friday. It's half an hour. It's very compelling. And, um, you know, whether or not you agree with JILV's mission, I'd say get on the email list and listen, because then you can broaden your worldview and you have a, you know, then there's more hope if you uh, know more, like in a very cliche sort of way, knowledge is power. I always tell my students, you know, check out what your news sources are and make sure that it's representing a real range. Um, and I hope, you know, I, I think sometimes of that Talmudic teaching, if you save one life, it's as if you save the whole world. And I hope that people can hold on to that um, little bit of wisdom because resignation can creep in really easily. Like, oh, I'm just one person. What could I possibly do? But you know what? You make a good difference with one person. That person will talk to another person on the playground and talk to another person. So don't give in to that sense of um, like, what can I do? You know, maybe nothing. That's not true. Everybody can do something. And um, you can make a point of every day saying something positive to another human being around, you know, gathering knowledge or having a meaningful conversation. Or if you're scared to share um, your point of view, try it, but pick your, pick your battles carefully. You know, don't doom scroll <laughs> uh, on social media and don't engage with people who are so far gone that they're not going to be able to listen. You know, there's people on both extremes, the far right and the far left who are so ideologically committed to their, their place. It's almost as if their minds have been possessed, I think. Um, I even sometimes call it nowadays like a collective psychosis. Like if you are so ensconced in your viewpoint and all you're talking to are people who completely agree with you, you know, you're you're in a silo out of which you cannot see. So those it are not- like during people. COVID, during right. COVID and the lockdowns and, you know, people who like dug their heels in and wouldn't listen. They were like, follow the science. But in fact- you know, they weren't, they weren't doing that or, or people who demand, you know, say that the science is settled. There is no settled science. It's kind of an oxymoron. So yeah. it's, it's just like, yeah, that. I agree. But I, I think not everybody can, can, can do what I'm suggesting, which is to um, try to listen to another point of view, just to see what that other person is saying and even to more persuasively um, disprove it <laughs> if necessary. You know, just just gather as many points of view as possible, and you're probably going to realize that if you're never adjusting your point of view, then you're being a little too rigid. You know, like everybody should change their view sometimes, and if you never do that, then then you know that's a problem. Um, but I'm like a centrist by nature. I am registered independent. I can look both ways, and I used to think that that was a weakness of mine because I didn't really belong anywhere. But then I ultimately sort of realized that um, it's a strength because I can look in both directions. And by the way, we shouldn't be in a binary anyway, <laughs> um, because that's not reality. It shows up in, in many shades of gray. So make sure that your news sources are, are plentiful and that maybe your friends are plentiful and that the strangers that you talk to come from different walks of life and choose who you do try to engage with um, carefully, um, not to go to people who are on either of the extremes, but someone who's maybe uh, open to some conversation and, and have that conversation because you never know the end result of the conversation that, that, that you took the risk to have. That's great. And we should also <clears throat> make sure that we try to teach our children this as well. I mean, an organization that we've been working with over the past few months is Incubate Debate, which sprung up um, just over the past couple of years to combat the, the illiberalism in, in high school debates and is expanding. Um, and as, as James um, started the organization says, James Fishback, um, the, it's, it's not just about debate with a capital D, which is like the set debate that, you know, that's scheduled, but also debate with a small D, debate in the classroom, debate at the playground, being able to listen to each other and, and respect uh, other people's viewpoints. So that's something I think that if we can access the, the youth and help them open their minds, because kids are very curious naturally, that's a really good, you know, thing to strive for. 
Yeah, definitely. I think healthy debate is, is, is very rare, if not completely dead in academia. And as I'm writing to some chancellors of certain universities, namely like the UC system and, and other places as well, one of my asks is to please incorporate healthy dialogue on campus. Arrange colloquia where you specifically invite people with different viewpoints to have constructive dialogue and even constructive disagreement, um, because that is like a dead art, really, at the universities. People are not invited. Sometimes um, people with different points of view are disinvited, and sometimes there's so much heckling that the speaker can't be heard. There's all sorts of videos available where you can see, you know, when that happens. Um, but, it, it, you know, there should be no ad hominem attacks. There should be room for disagreement, healthy disagreement. It's not like human beings are ever going to agree on everything. So that's not even a, a goal that we should have. Um, but, it, it, you know, the university is supposed to be a universe of, of, of opinions and um, they need to be there so that we can really sort of ascertain what the truths are. And if we don't, in, if we're not more inclusive, there's plenty of diversity on campuses, but there's not viewpoint diversity. And I think that is something to be, uh, you know, really wary about. And I, I hope it's going to improve. Um, and just to get back to, you know, a final sort of suggestion is to definitely get yourself on a various email lists and uh, look for the surveys that are going to be coming out to see where this sort of viewpoint diversity is increasingly welcomed and where it is not. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's kind of how I'm thinking of it as well. Um, well, thank you. I think this has been a really great conversation and um, we'll share the links to your um, podcast as well. Um, do you do you moderate your podcast? Do you do it or is it other? Um, the one on JLB? Yeah. No. So the two people who usually do the podcast are David Bernstein, the founder of JLV, and Brandy Shafatinsky, okay. who is the director of education and community uh, relations. And they have a wonderful, very compelling, I mean, I'm biased towards it, I suppose, but I think that everybody should listen to it because either you agree or you're going to learn something about what they're saying um, so that you're you know, more informed about, you know, what other people are saying. So there are the two usual suspects, as they sometimes say on, on Fridays at, at noon, which has already passed today, I see. It's East Coast time. Um, but it's posted on, on the, the website, so you can go listen to all the past uh, conversations. Great. Well, thank you so much, and um, really appreciate having an opportunity to talk to you, and happy Hanukkah, and let's do it again soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really fun.